The Five Live Cricket Show. Hello and welcome to the Five Live Cricket Show with me, Eleanor Oldroyd. Now, between and in the next 90 minutes, we're going to talk cricket. Then it'll be Kazra Alom stepping in for Colin Murray at 10.30. But there is plenty to get stuck into before then, with England's defeat to West Indies creating lots of talk about Joe Root's future as captain. We'll also discuss England reaching the semi-finals of the Women's World Cup as well. And with me to talk it all through and offer their expert insight are Phil Tufnell, Jimmy Anderson, Michael Vaughan and Carlos Brathwaite. Evening all. Evening all. Evening. Lovely to talk to you all. Yes. Carlos, I kind of feel we should start with you because you, out of all this group of cheerful people, are probably the happiest. Um, <laughs> West Indies beating England in the Test Series and reaching the Women's World Cup semi-finals. It's been a good week for you. Yeah, I kind of feast. West Indies cricket deserve it. Um, it's been a good week. The women um, had... a uh, Nervous wait, um, waiting on another result to see if they'd qualify. It was a nice moment to watch them all together, um, enjoying the actual qualification. I realised Stefani Taylor in the corner actually realised that Australia will be next opponents and it wasn't too much time to celebrate. Um, but just getting the final four of itself is a fantastic achievement. And then test cricket-wise, sensational Um victory in the last test um, when you were behind for two thirds of a series and still end up winning winning 1-0 is aching to a team hanging on for a draw and snatching a late win in football and we managed to do that and so does the hallmark a good team so I don't think that West Indies are world beaters at the moment um, but they have certainly find, found and finding some foundations that they can build upon yeah, we're going to talk a lot about the way the West Indies have developed and are developing. And as you say, not the finished article yet, but making progress. And it's been a long time where England have not won in West Indies uh, mm. very much in recent years. So that pattern is continuing. But we are, of course, going to start in Grenada. England slumping to a 10-wicket defeat in the third and final test uh, to lose the series 1-0. They've now lost England four test series in a row. Wow. Ouch. Still to be decided the series against <laughs> India as well, let's not forget. They're without a win in nine matches. They're bottom of the World Test Championship. Lots of questions to answer, particularly about the future of England's test side. And the one thing everybody is talking about is whether Joe Root should continue as captain. We'll get the views of the guys in a second. But here is what Joe Root said to our correspondent, Jonathan Agnew, about his position. I'm still very passionate about taking this team forward. And I feel like there's the support of the dressing room behind me. And... I'm desperate to turn that around and, and to see them smiling, celebrating because we don't feel that far away. Um, it's an easy thing to say and it's, it's probably a frustration for a lot of people to hear but very passionate about taking it forward and um, you know, we'll, hopefully that'll be the case. So you, you want to carry on. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, is there? No manager, no director, no coach, no chairman. I mean, there seems to be such little in place as far as the administration is concerned but, but you, you want to carry on as captain. Yeah, I've made that quite clear. And uh, you know, all I can control is what's in my hands, and, and that's trying at the minute. That's trying to take this team forward and take it on, and I, I'll do everything I can in, in whatever capacity to help England win games of cricket, um, I, and that that will never change. Do you share the, the fans' view, or some fans' view, that, that with all these positions that are vacant at the moment, there, there is this kind of feeling of void about the English cricket? I, again, that's out of my control. My, my control is looking after what's here right now and this group of players and making sure we're doing everything we can to get the best out of each other and putting the, you know, the, the talent and energy and, and efforts into performance and, and wins. And It's frustrating studying with nothing to show off the back of a, a very hard-fought series, but we have to take quite a lot of confidence from very good cricket on this trip. I've got to ask you about the emissions of Broad and Anderson just because they kind of seem relevant and in these conditions. I mean, were you looking for them during this game? I mean, we can, we've gone going over old ground here, haven't we? We've, we've spoken enough about that, if, if being honest. Um, could say the same about the two injured lads as well that, that could have been very useful on that wicket, 90 mile an hour bowler in, uh, in Woody and someone with Robbo's skill level could also look at that. But the one thing that we have got from this trip is we've seen two young, young debutants come in and show a lot of promise. and. You know, they're at the start of a very exciting journey and you know, we've learned a lot about a number of other aspects as well yeah. in that department. So Joe Root's numbers as captain, 64 games, more than anyone else, 27 wins, 26 defeats, 11 draws. That's a win percentage of 42.18. 
Uh, guys, I just wanted to read you a quote from Tim Lyle in The Observer yesterday. Joe Root, world-class batsman, has one great misfortune. He has to play under Joe Root, third-rate captain. Harsh? <laughs> fair? What do you speak to? Yeah, what do you I, think, I, Phil? I, I, feel for, I feel for Joe. I do feel for Joe. He's, he's sitting there. You can hear it in his voice. He's, he's still extremely passionate. And he says he's got the dressing room behind him and all the guys, which I think he has. I'm sure he has. I think that everyone over there was, was you know, completely focused but they're just not getting any results, are they, at the moment? As you say, I think it's one in 17 or something, bottom of the pile, and and you just get a feeling. I read a quote uh, from Aggers uh, today, you know, you just got a feeling that it's the, an end of an era for Joe Root. They've got to get the people in place. They've got to get the coach in place. They've got to get the director of cricket in place before they even start thinking about the captaincy because who knows what they're going to think when they come in. They might have a completely different um, idea of how it, it, all, it, all's, it all's going to look. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's been tough. It's been a tough watch now for quite a while. And I, I don't know whether it's doing Joe any good either, really. You know, I think mm. sometimes you, you've got to step back a little bit and uh, you know, just just look after yourself as a player. But it's starting to become tougher and tougher, I think, for Joe. Because every time England go out to play now, that is the the, the burning question. You know, should he be captain? Shouldn't he be captain? And all this kind of stuff. So yeah, some tough questions to be asked, I think, coming up. What do you think it is doing for him, Jimmy? What's what doing for him? The just the, just the stress of the captaincy, having to stand and talk to Aggers after test yeah. match after test match when he's just lost. Yeah, well, I mean, that's part and parcel of being captain. And, you know, you've, you've got to front up in situations like that. Um, you know, I think he, he's right. He, he has got the dressing room. You can see how passionate mm. he is. He's, he's desperate for England to do well. He's, he's got it. He's got cricket in his blood you know it's something that he's dreamt of as a uh, from a from being a kid and he's desperate for England to do well and he wants to be the man taking the team forward um but as Phil touched on there you know it's it there could be well there there will be two new people in those high positions in the director of cricket and a head coach and it'll be down to them um you know as to what they think the, the best way to move forward is well we've had Jeffrey Boycott we've had Michael Atherton Nasser Hussain all saying that Joe Root's captaincy should end. Michael, as, as a former England captain yourself, what do you reckon? Um, I, I'll take you through his reign. I mean, you know, during his reign, he, I, I don't think he's been helped at all. Um, you go back to when he started. Um, his first tour to Australia, there was the Ben Stokes incident. Went to Australia without his key all-rounder. Um, then COVID hit. Well, before COVID, it was the white ball set, you know, for that 2019 World Cup win. Everything was put into the white ball basket. It worked. It got England that World Cup win. Um, I don't think Joe was helped around that time that well from the ECB. Uh, Since the 2019 World Cup, everything was going to be about the ashes and and trying to make sure that England arrived in Australia to compete. COVID hit and it's been very, very difficult. Um, I look at the last seven years of English cricket and they've had 25 debutants that have come into the England team. Uh, and that is batters, all-rounders, or wicketkeeper batters. And there's only one of them, just one, and that's Rory Burns that's averaged over 30. So the conveyor belt's not worked in terms of the quality that Joe's having to work with, uh, particularly in the batting department. Um, if he rings me in the next week and asks for some advice, I'll be dead honest with you, I'd tell him to step down. I just think mm-hmm. he's taken it as far as he possibly can. Um, will the England Test Match team be any worse off um, not having Joe as a cat? I don't think they would because they're going to get his runs. They're going to get him as a you know, senior player in the team. They're going to get a, a great role model. I, I don't think there's a better role model in English cricket than Joe Root. And I think because you know, Jimmy's just mentioned, he's, he's an absolute cricket tragic and he's desperate for England to win and do well. And I, I would advise him now at his stage of his career... Phil mentioned it as well that whatever happens from here on if, if he carries on it's all going to be about Joe Root mm. and I, I just think this test match team might actually go even further back before it goes forward I think we've got some tough times ahead for the test match team I don't look at it and think Phew, you know get Jimmy back in get Brodie back in and everything's going to be rosy you know until they can score runs and until they can see off you know Kyle Mayers is an all-rounder that just hit a length and didn't do a great deal with it and got five for nothing because the batters just panicked. And that's been the case for three or four years now. It's not just a, 
you know, a, a sudden reaction that the Test match team has, has suddenly become a, a, a bad team. You know, the batting unit has been collapsing and collapsing from nowhere as soon as they get under pressure. And that was my fear on day three in Grenada, that as soon as that batting unit was put under pressure, I, I think there wouldn't be many England fans and certainly pundits and probably ex-players that weren't watching thinking, we know what's going to happen here. Because Mayers will hit a length and he'll just ask the bats to play a four defence or two and they'll panic. They might play two or three and then all of a sudden they'll look to score and play a big drive. You know, so I, I would advise him to step down. Um, my, obviously, my, I'm quite my, close my, to him. 64 games is a long time. Yeah. Um, if he wants to carry on and he's got the energy, oh, he's better than me. Because I'm not too sure how you get the energy to captain uh, this team at the minute. Yeah, but Mike, if if he does step down, and and the question is, is who's then going to take over the, the captaincy? By him stepping down, isn't necessarily going to make them go out and score any more runs, is it? You know what I mean? No, so, it's not. I mean, and and if he's got the energy, Phil, and the desperation yeah. to carry on, he probably will carry on. But yeah. um, I I don't think they'll be worse off without him, Phil. No, you know, I, I honestly don't. And, and if it is that Ben Stokes is given the role for a year and a half oh. until the end of the Ashes, big ask. If it is that you. You go left field, bring Stuart yeah, Broad in. He captains the side for a year and a half. Uh, I, I heard Sam Billings mentioned today, which I was like, oh, wait a minute, he's not even in the team. He's only played one mm. test match. Um, so there's not a great deal, but Joe has to do what's right for him. You know, and what I wouldn't want to see is the new director and coach to suddenly go, you know, we're sacking him. Mm. You know, Joe Root's earned the right to go on his own own, own ground and I just recommend that at his stage I mean as I said 64 games is a long time more than anybody else has ever done uh, the England captain and it drains the life out of you you know having mm. to do interview after interview one test match winning 17 uh, I can't imagine what he's going through um, yeah. so it's not easy as Jimmy said he's passionate and he'll want to carry on but I personally would advise him to step down yeah Carlos, is is it a situation a bit like you know about you, your your football team, Manchester United? You know that in the end you have to get a you have to get a caretaker in, caretaker caretaker manager or yeah, caretaker Ralph captain. He was at the cricket. And, uh, <laughs> well, he, well, he yeah, was, he wasn't he? Yeah, minutes. bizarrely. What was he doing? He Ralph that Rangnick turned up, didn't he? It um, was it in in Barbados. He, he appeared. Yeah, can he bat? <laughs> <My, my chest. laughs> <laughs> what position you batting him open number four or? <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think that I think that's an important part as well because you're talking about Joe's captain, and you know he finds himself in a precarious position as being probably one of the only people that performing on a consistent basis, other than um, Messrs. Anderson and Broad that they left at home for whatever reason, um, and yet the whole world crumbling around him, and he's the only person that everyone talking about. Yeah. So as a batsman, does he bat three? Does he bat four? Like you want your best batsman to choose the position they want to bat. It's almost as though he is a sacrificial lamb for the strength of the batting lineup. Then with captaincy, I don't think, regardless of who's captain, it will start with being 48 for four on the first day of a test series. And then there's nobody ahead of him being coach, director, cricket, whatever other position, wherever. Post, um, post to create that is um, that is standard and has the post long term is all interim all interim so even if Joe decided this is a way we want to play and this way I made the comments that I made after the f first test because it's all fine and dandy to say oh we want to play this positive brand of cricket and you know we can there's six wickets left and we can only call it off and there's five balls left then you fast forward to Barbados and you bat all the way to lunch. If you're really playing positive cricket, you leave an extra half hour, 45 minutes before lunch, let West Indies feel they could get the runs and it look at look at what happened in the second test. Hindsight is 2020, but he said it at the time. They needed that 30 minutes, that 45 minutes. That is a positive brand of cricket. Now, who decides what is a positive brand? Who decides how far we go to try to win? even if we try to lose, or not try to lose, but give ourselves the chance, knowing that we may lose, to try to win. Mm -hmm. There's no one above to set that. It's just Joe trying to do everything, be everybody. And for that reason, you probably should step down. If, if England cricket boy can put a framework around him to say, similar to what they did with Owen Morgan, you have this power, you choose how you want to play, you pick players, you back players, then fine. But if not, and it's going to be a mess all around me, 
then I don't want my average dropping from 50 to 35 just mm-hmm. to say I'm England captain for another 20 tests. Jimmy, you, you among all of us here is the only one who's actually been captained by Joe Root. Um, how is he as a captain? Well, I've really enjoyed him. I think he's been he's been brilliant. Um, you know, he's someone, as, as I touched on before, it's something I think, you know, England captain was probably a, a dream of his as a kid growing up. You know, he's got a big cricketing family as well. Um, and yeah, I think he's he's sort of definitely grown into it. And he, it, that, that sort of passion um, and determination is something that does rub off on other players. Um, and I think Michael's right with what he said about actually he's, he's been dealt a pretty rough hand over the last yeah. couple of years with COVID. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but the amount of different um, selections in that time as well, trying to rotate and look after players' mental health and things like that, not having your strongest team, you know, as much as you probably want as a captain. I think that's been tough on him. Um, but he's risen above that. He's, he's sort of, he's always positive, trying to find the positive angle on it. And the biggest thing for me is, and the biggest thing for English cricket is it's not affected his batting. He still he sco- had his, I think it was probably his best year yeah, in, in Test cricket last yeah. year. Yeah. Got another two hundreds in this series. So he's, you know, going forward, I think that that is a huge positive for for, for English cricket. Yeah, I, I totally agree. He has been dealt a little bit of a. <laughs> he's been a little bit unlucky with how the cards has dropped for him a little bit. But then you've got to be realistic and you've got to look at the stats and you've got to look where England are at the moment. And I can't particularly see anything changing okay the West Indies tour they fought hard they got stuck in they got some runs on some very flat pitches but you know it, it was just round the corner and it happened what what I do think that happens is if Joe does stay as England captain and I think it's going to be down to the coach I think that the coach that comes in has got to be a very experienced coach. I don't think that you can just go for one of these off-the-wall kind of coaches. You've got, you've got to have someone with a tried and tested record. And we keep going back to football analogies here and what have you, but you've got to have someone to work from the base up and who's been there and done the hard yards to understand it, like a Kirsten or like a Langer or something like that. I think that that is going to be absolutely crucial to how then this England team look to move forward. And if Joe stays in that position, even though he's done 54... Phil, I, 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 even though he's done 64-odd test matches, and I, and I don't mean to have a go at Joe, I still don't feel that he's sort of like... Is a is an England captain who's done more captaincy than anyone else. I think he needs a strong person by his side if he's going to stay, and that is through the coach and the hierarchy at the top. Yeah, and, and also we've got to be honest. You know, tactically he's been poor. Yeah, you know, he, he got his yeah, tactics yeah, wrong in, in Grenada. You know, he just didn't seem to be uh, out of the box thinking enough when that tail end started to wag. It was all the same. Oh yeah, you've got an attack that doesn't have the express pace, and you're missing yeah. your two senior bowlers but I didn't see enough in terms of bowling around the wicket changing angles just trying to make it just a little bit awkward for the tailor and that's been a common trend for quite a while with Joe's captaincy yeah, you know yeah. you can look at selectorially all right there's been issues with COVID but when the team arrived in Brisbane you know he's the captain yeah. He, he, yeah. he batted and also picked a side that was completely not suited for those conditions that's you as a yeah. captain you have to take responsibility for that you yeah. know you go back to India at Lords last year when that tail end wagged again Mohammed Shami and the ball was flying to all parts and we had a you know a short ball theory when it was just top of off required so it has been a common trend under Joe that he, he's not managed to kind of grab a game he's let a game just kind of Miranda along and the opposition have kind of just steadily and gradually as the West Indies did in Grenada brilliantly they played a real disciplined hard game and he just kind of just kept on chipping away chipping away and all of a sudden they get a lead and you pretty much know the rest of what's going to happen with the mm. batting unit. But, you know, tactically, you know, I, I have been disappointed in, in seeing some of his kind of manoeuvres that have not worked and he's missed a few tricks and he's let games just drift. And when you let games drift at the highest yeah. level, oppositions and particularly the likes of Australia, India, and now the West Indies, who are just an OK side, they make you count. So that'll be something that if he does carry on, you know, he really does have to have someone with him that can really drive the tactical side of the mm. game with him as well. And I wonder what you think about that, Jimmy, because obviously, you know, again, you're out on the field in, the, in these situations, you know, the India game at Lords that, that Vaughan mentioned and during the Ashes. Yeah, and that's so, certainly something that um, as a senior player, you, you also take responsibility for. And as a senior bowler, that you know, that the batting's been criticised quite a lot. But actually, you know, in, when was it the first innings when 
the West Indies were 120 for seven, I think, and they ended up getting 290 odd. That's, you know, those situations have happened uh, quite a bit. And as a bowler, that you, you've got to take some responsibility for that as well. And yeah, as I said, a senior player, we try, you know, on the field, you're trying to talk a lot, trying to discuss the options that you've got, trying to discuss what is the best way to go in that um, that situation. Ultimately, he as as captain has the final say, but you do try and help out as much as you can. Um, so yeah, it is. I mean, it's just frustrating when that happens, uh, and sometimes you do get it wrong, uh, both as a bowler and a captain. So. Just one of those things, but you, you and, and do you t- do you take a sort of collective responsibility if if that happens? Well, I think you've got to. I think you know it's it's not Joe's fault that the the batters don't uh, or struggle getting runs, or it's it's not his fault that the bowlers don't bowl in the right place. You know, sometimes you know when, when that happens, it's our fault as a player. You've got to look at yourself and and see how you can improve, how you can help the team perform better. Um, and yeah, the, I think the, the important thing, you've got to have that relationship with your captain to try and get the, the field right um, and, and the, the sort of tactics right for that particular passage of play. And then it's down to you as the individual to execute those skills. Yeah. I mean, sometimes though, Jimmy, I mean, I've played under a quite a lot of captains for England, funnily enough, because they didn't hang around too long. Um, but um, at some time... This, this has nothing to do with you, Tuffers, was well, it? Well, no, perhaps. And this is, this is Jimmy's point. Sometimes you've got to do it as a collector, but then sometimes you've got to go right, because ultimately his, his, ne- his neck's on the block as captain and he lives and dies by his decisions and I think sometimes Joe perhaps as as Vaughan has just said there has missed the trick about just going right hold on a minute thanks for all your input but this is how I want to do it and I think sometimes does he do that enough Jimmy or not? Definitely I'd say he's definitely like that as you know it's his ultimately his decision you know it comes back to him he will check there's, there's other plays in the side, he's got Ben Stokes as his vice-captain, he talks to him a lot about certain scenarios and situations and what is the best thing for the team at this point. Yeah. But then ultimately, his, you know, he then decides, well, if, if, you know, if there's two sides of a, uh, uh, or two different opinions, then he's got to try and figure out which one is the best for the team at that point. Yeah. Carlos, when, when Craig Brathwaite and the West Indies team saw the England squad for that tour and there was no Broad and no Anderson, um, hey, hey. <laughs> yeah, happy days. I mean, well, what, do you think it would have been a very different story if if, if Jimmy and, and Stuart Broad had been out there? Yeah, I mean, with all due respect, he legend, not only because he's on here, but the two names that you just call find ways to get batsmen out. And England would have won that test match, easiest. Carlos, I think. Do you? do you think England would have won that test match, that last test match with Broad and Anderson there? Um, I can't, I won't go as far to say they would definitely didn't get any runs. Uh, yeah, no, I, I know, know but you're still on that pitch. The development, but, you're going to get some runs. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, what but, do you want to say about my batting? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd have been around with Jack Leach, well you could have got a century. Move, so no. <laughs> <laughs> go on, let's go um, but, on. But Sorry. yeah, I, I think it is it's more of a, a sense of those guys know how to get wickets. So whether it be changing it up. Sometimes you see nothing happen and Jimmy picks a fight, Broad picks a fight. All of a sudden, they're running with the ball, holding in the left hand. The ball not swinging anymore and it was over a goal. But they create stuff through their sheer experience alone. They've been in situations like that more often than not. However, you've now brought a group of bowlers outside of the comfort zone. Your most experienced being Chris Wokes, who his um, record has been picked apart between home and away. So you bring brought a new bowling attack outside of the comfort zone, um, and the ones that aren't experienced, um, when you get into that situation, as we see in most of the games, from the time the ball got 45 overs old, nothing happened. Literally just a waiting game till the second new ball. But you can throw the ball 60 overs old to Jimmy Anderson, short broad. Even if they aren't doing anything with the ball, their sheer experience alone, the weight of the name, can maybe get you a wicket. So, yes, it, it didn't make a massive difference. But on the flip side, if England had gone on to win the series, you'd then be talking about, you know, it was good to rest Broad and Anderson. We found Saki Mahmood. Um, we've seen what Overton can do. We've seen what Fisher can do. What a start, hit the deck hard. So I think it's either it's one or two looking at a glass half full 
or half empty because if England had won, it would have been a master stroke. Lee Broad and Anderson at home, they're going to rip up in the summer in England and you give new guys a chance to go out there, throw them in the deep end, see if they swim. And I think you have found guys, you have found a Saki Mahmood who I really enjoyed. You, you have to have skill at that level, but you also have to have heart. And he showed a lot of heart, whether it was with bat or with ball. So you've definitely found someone, you've unearthed someone, you've unearthed a Matt Fisher who can now go back to county cricket as a test player, knowing that all of a sudden he's not the hunter, he's the hunted. He needs to go and get rickets on a regular. Everyone is looking at him now. It's no easy road. You don't rock it and people play loose drives at you because you're just a county bowler. You're now a test cricketer. How will he handle that time? So I think a lot of good has come from the tour, but ultimately you need to win or that good could all of a sudden be perceived as bad as it is now. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and once again, you're, you're right, Mike. We're talking about the bowlers. We're not getting any runs. It's got no <laughs> runs. I mean, ultimately, obviously, Jimmy and Stuart on the tour would have made a difference. No, no question. Mm. You know, the legends yeah. of the game, fantastic. England have been losing without them as well. So, you know, let's just put it into context. I just look at the tour party that was picked, and let's just judge that group of players that were in the West Indies. Did they maximise potential? For the mm. first two games, one or two stuck their hands up on flat wickets and did well. When the pressure's on, that's when you judge players. So it came to the last week in Grenada, and you cannot tell me that that group of players played to any way near potential when the pressure was on. No. Now, you're not asking that. I'm not suddenly saying to you know someone that Alex Lee's to go and play like uh, Matthew Hayden, because he's not. He's just a young player making his way in the game. You know, you're looking at that group of players, and I just look at their performance, and that's the bowling, the batting, and then tactically in the capsi. England didn't play anywhere near potential. And I would have, you know, I always think captains should really pride themselves. And, and can you maximise every ounce of ability in the dressing room? Can you get every ounce of uh, discipline, uh, you know, personality, performance out of all the players in the dressing room? And, and this last few days, it was a huge disappointment that England had got so many positives from the first two games, particularly with the bat in hand and Saki, who I think is going to be around. Jimmy's played a lot with him and seen him at Old Trafford. He looks the one player that I think will be around England Test match team for a number of years. He's just like he's got it. He's got whatever it is, he's got it. Now, I just looked at the side and go, why is it that they perform so under potential? You look at the West Indies, Ellie. The West Indies don't have our system. They don't have all our indoor centres. They don't have all our psychologists. Yet what did they do in the last week? They played great discipline. They've got nothing Carlos over there. Look at the dis discipline performance that they gave in comparison to what England have got. And that would be a real concern for me if I was in the England management team. I, w I want to come back and talk more about West Indies um, after 10 o'clock. And I also want to look in a bit more, bit more detail about what went Obviously, what went wrong for England, but what went right for England? Because there were there were those little little spots of light, weren't there? As you say, Michael, there was Saki Mahmood, um, you know, Alex Lees was a bit of stickability at the top of the order. But I, I just kind of want to stick, go, drag us back to the, the succession potentially for, for Joe Root, and then we'll go on to talk about who the next coach, the next director of cricket. There's so many positions to be filled at, at the ECB. Be, I think if any stoked. of us put our CVs in, you know, we could probably find a role somewhere between between the a, uh, the six of a, us. Can you get a player um, coach? Like in football, oh, you have player coaches, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> it can only be Stokes, it, God. It can only be Ben Stokes, Ellie. Can I, can I, just, can I just throw the, the, the issue then of, of potential... So potential captain out mm. there... Does Ben Stokes want to be England captain, Jimmy? Tough job. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's hard for me to say. We, you know, he's, he's thoroughly enjoyed his role as vice captain. Um, there have been moments uh, in his vice captaincy that he's had to to captain the team. I think Adelaide, when Joe Root got hit in the uh, midriff in the <coughs> nets in the morning, he missed the first hour of that day's play. So Ben um, took charge of that. Um, and he thoroughly enjoyed it and he was great as well. He was, you know, he, he, you could see he was, he, he thinks about the game a lot. Um, although he, he comes across as this sort of player that plays on instinct and he's sort of a match winner, he does think about the game a lot and I think, you know, tactically he's pretty good. And he, but um, whether he wants it or not, I'm not sure. You know, he's someone who plays all forms of cricket. He plays the IPL. He played, you know, there's a lot of, cricket in the year for him to put the England captaincy on that as well um, you know it, it might be uh, I, I'm not saying it, it wouldn't be possible but it was it'd just be a lot for or a lot on his plate Jimmy what would you do if they asked you to step in for the summer oh hello go on son 
Uh, well, it'd be it's a, not be a, a, <laughs> be a turnaround to from, a few from, years ago. You did mention captaincy. It'd be a turnaround from drop to, to captain in a month, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, well, I think we can safely assume that. <laughs> I no. think we can safely assume you're going to be I've playing got, at Lords in June. I've got, Jim. I've got a question. I've got a question. You haven't answered it yet, Phil. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, go come on. on. Yes, yes, don't let him off the hook. No, okay. I, I was think if there to... was any any sort of captaincy aspirations, I think they've they've gone. You know, it's this this team doesn't need a 39 year old as captain. I think it needs. We, you know, we we're down the bottom of the the ICC Test Championship. Um, so we can't we can't get any lower. We need you know whoever if it, if whether it's Joe whether it's Ben, uh, but it's got to be looking to the future. I think. So, so what uh, about Mike, Stuart Broad? Can, can I mean, I'm, be... I'm just thinking, just kind of sit, just no. sort of sit, very very quickly. Sorry, Tavis, very just to kind of because a few people have said this that Stuart Broad potentially is as interim. You know, we've, we've got over a little oh, bit. We don't of need any more interims. No, <laughs> we don't no. need any more interims. <laughs> right. What okay. I was going to say, Mike. Is, right, what it? I was gonna, just going to say <laughs> quickly was. Can you can, can you get can you can you get someone who's not in this England sort of squad or England team outside and bring them into it as captain or is that just not feasible? Oh, I think whoever like is a, given the captain like a James Vince like a James Vince or I mean people have been saying these other sort of people this is, have been this is around the thing though, isn't it? They've, they've, they've got to be guaranteed selection, haven't yeah. they? I think the, the captain has got to be guaranteed I mean, when selection. I play, we which is pick why the best you poo-pooed the Stuart Broad <laughs> suggestion, but they, but but you know, well, because but Stuart, it's interim. You would everything's interim. The one thing we need mm. is not not these interims all the time. We need if someone to set a foundation. But if there's going to be a replacement for Joe, I I don't see at the minute that the replacement will be long term so I don't see if Ben Stokes got the job I don't see him doing it for five or six years whoever gets it now potentially could just do it for a few months or just do it until the end of the Ashes next year so it could be a, a senior pro that's been around the group who, who is going to be around the team and going to play um, so I don't that's think Stuart Broad it is the most stupid suggestion Thank no, you. I honestly I'm don't, Ellie. I think it is quite. Just, a, I'm not saying. We've got to be sensible about every name at the minute because you know we, we've not got a, a mass of riches. Um, it's the first time in my lifetime actually watching England's Test match team where we've not had a future England captain playing. There's always been, you know, one of the players that you go future England captain. Whether you go back to others, uh, then there was you know myself and Tris Gothic, and then there was. You know, Strauss who was around, then there was Alistair Cook came through and Joe Root came through. Perhaps At the Crawley. minute, I don't see a future England mm. captain and that, that is a real concern for the Test match yeah. team. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because we've talked about, I mean, you mentioned Zach Crawley, Tuffers. Um, we've yeah. talked about Ollie Pope, haven't we? We've talked about, uh, I don't know, um, potentially, um, well, I'm trying to think who else now. I mean, it, but, but whoever it would be, it's somebody who is not guaranteed of their place and is maybe just not the finished article yeah, but then Joe was very young, Jimmy, wasn't he? When he when he took over the captaincy, and I remember I remember Graham Swan saying, "You shouldn't give it to him now because it's just going to wreck him as a as the fun guy in the dressing room." Uh, well, yeah, I, it, it, well, I, I can't remember how old, how, how old he was when he he got it. Um, well, what is he thirty? What is he thirty now? Yeah, so I mean, now? yeah, but he's always. <laughs> He's always been pretty mature, like deep down. He's always, you know, when he needs to be serious, he's serious. And um, I just think, f like you mentioned all those names there, I think, um, you know, it is difficult for me to talk about this as a century contracted mm. player, but um, it's. I, I just feel that like it's got to be someone who is going to play. Like if you go for a bowler, we've, you know, we know what happens with bowlers being injured, rotating, resting and whatever else. Miss the odd tour. <laughs> <laughs> so I just feel I feel like it it, it helps that Joe is it, you, he's our best player. He's going to be in the team. That that I'm not saying that's why he's captain, but that is it helps. Um, and I, I, I honestly think that's why he'll he'll keep going, uh, you know, moving forward. And as as was touched on, I think as, if you get the right people uh, in those two jobs uh, uh, above him, then I think he, he can still do a, a really good job. Mm. Well, look, let's talk about some of those questions, as, as you mentioned, Jimmy, because there are lots of roles to fill. Uh, no managing director at the moment or director of cricket, no permanent head coach in place yet. It certainly feels like those two roles just need to be sorted before any real change can happen. As Jim says, um, interim coach Paul Collingwood believes that he's had a positive impact on the team after taking over a disjointed dressing room. 
I don't think there was a, a, a real togetherness, certainly coming out of Australia. Um, the, the, the players and the management were very open about the effects of Australia, I guess. So what I kind of inherited coming into this was there was a lot of scar tissue and I think the players were very open and very honest and um, we were very direct on how we want to go about things and there's a real clarity now of how, we, how they want to move forward and, it, and I guess my job as interim coach was just to get everyone, everyone back together, give them many roles in the team or to be able to pass the team on to whoever takes over in a better place and as simple as that and I feel as though that's that's been achieved and people will turn around and, and see the results but they won't see what's what's happened in the dressing room and, and I think that's as, as powerful as anything. But the realistic side of it is that you lost the match and lost the series and people are now really questioning the future of the captain and that's not a good place for the team to be either. Well no and but we are in a results industry and um, we all realise that um, but I would say that the captain has been fantastic in terms of trying to drive this team forward he's got the determination to do it um, he, wa he wants to turn things around it's as simple as that and um, we understand we're going to get criticised when you when you don't win West Indies is a difficult place to come let's remember this as well we won once here in 50 years we give ourselves a chance in the first two games um, of doing something special but we weren't quite good enough come the, the third test match and um, but Joe himself has been magnificent in terms of how he's gone about his business in the dressing room getting the, the players back together and um, there's been a real drive and determination to turn things around. I mean, realistically, does, does it feel like there's a bit of a vacuum at the moment? I mean, there's no full-time chairman. There's lots of talk about the chief executive leaving. There's no managing director. There's no coach. People are talking about the, the future of the captain. I mean, it, it, outside looking in, it, it does look like a vacuum. Well, it, I guess there's, there's uncertainty around because, you know, people are uncertain about the jobs, I guess, moving forward. We, who knows what happens if a new coach comes in? Are we going to keep our jobs? The one thing that's that I had to make sure as interim coach that I was passing this team on in a better place. Um, not just the players, but the management, the togetherness, uh, more self-sufficient team, more voices in the dressing room. And if they continue doing that moving forward, then you'll get better results um, out on the park. And we all knew it wasn't gonna happen overnight, but what I've seen from attitude is if they continue in that vein, then they will get results and, and become better cricketers very quickly. Well, that was Paul Collingwood, England's interim coach currently. Michael Vaughan, you've been raising your eyebrows a little bit listening to that. Yeah, I mean, because it, it, I think it's got to hit home that this, this Test Match team, you know, you put a new coach in there, you put a new director of cricket, you put a new cap, it, it's suddenly not going to produce magic. In the last 40 years, the England Test Match men's team have been the number one in the world for 12 months. And that was Jimmy's team back in 2010, 11, 12. In the same period of time, Australia had been the number one team in the world for 170 months. So, you know, th this conveyor belt that I, I mentioned earlier about these young batters that are coming through the system, for the last seven years, this isn't in the last two years, this is the last seven years, the last 25 players, only one player has averaged over 30, and that's 30.32, that's nothing. You know, until the conveyor belt is sorted, and still the until the structure is sorted better and we start producing more you know qualified if you like red ball players I, I, and once Jimmy and Stuart mm. do decide that enough's enough I, I just think that this test match team might just go a little bit further back you've got to remember in the UK we've pretty much dominated for years and years you, you have a bad winter and then you come back to the UK and yeah. within a couple of weeks you go well, we're back with a Duke ball and we're winning and everything's, everything seems fine last summer was, was a little bit of a warning sign for me that New Zealand came over and, and out, you know, there's a lot of changes to the team but they outdisciplined England 2-1 down to India there's one test to go this, win, this summer again they've got New Zealand for three then they've got India for that last test match and then South Africa coming who are a developing side I don't think it's going to be like the old days where you just came back to the English conditions and, and, and get two or three quick victories. You know, I do think this Test Match team might take one, two, three, four, five years to try and get back to some kind of standard of what we used to. But ultimately, that stat of just 12 months in 40 years is one that the whole game needs to look at and go, OK, 
enough's enough. How can we prepare a system and players that come into Test Match Cricket to give England a better chance of being the number one team for longer? And it's not going to happen overnight. Well, well, so who is the person who's going to take them back to the top, do you think? Because, because you know, they, they've come from a long way down, haven't they, in the past? So at that point, you know, when, when, when you became the number one test team in the world, Jimmy, it was not, you know, there, there was all sorts of turmoil around the team in the build-up to that. And then it kind of came good. Um, and, and, and so, so it, what sort of person does it take? I mean, does it take an Andy Flower to do that again, do you think? You asking and I'm not me? Saying, I'm not saying. I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm not saying it should be Andy Flower, by the way. But no. but you know, of, of all of all the, the the names that are in the frame, what what kind of a person would you like to see taking over as the head coach? Well, I, I mean, it's a it's a tough one because Andy Flower worked with that group of players. You know, he was he was quite a tough uh, taskmaster. He he would you know push us quite hard in training. Um, our training sessions would be really really tough. But you felt like you'd improve and you'd, you'd get better through that period. Um, and he'd come down on you as well. If you didn't play well, he'd, he'd be straight on you and tell you, be, be brutally honest with you and tell you this is how it is. Um, which I think worked with that group of players, a, a pretty experienced group of players, who'd all, you know, all sort of around 30. You might need someone slightly different with a, you know, a slightly younger team. You know, the, the batters that have played in the West Indies generally, you know, we've got quite a few coming through that are 25 and under. Uh, so that might need a slight, slightly different person to, to deal with that. But, you know, I, I just think you need... It's important in, well, in all sport, really, to have... For, well, in cricket in particular, with the captain, the, the captain and coach have got to have a good relationship and got to be sort of on the same wavelength in terms of how they want the team to play uh, and the, the players that they, they want to use, I guess. So... Um, you know, I, 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 it's difficult for me to, to give you a name right now, but I think that's the sort of character you need, someone who is just absolutely crystal clear on how they want that team to perform. Yeah, and, and I said it earlier, really, I think they've got to have experience because when you come into a, a, a dressing room, and, and um, a colleague mentioned it there, you know, a disjointed dressing room after Australia and he's trying to put the pieces back together a little bit. You've got to then, if he is going to hand it over to someone, someone who understands that and then can move it forward. I think it needs to be experience, has got to be mm. the key. If you're trying to rebuild something and put foundations in, as Jimmy said, you know, um, you've got to have a clear path of what how's that going to look but that can only come from experience and having done that or been in that position and then made things better for my mind it's got to be someone who's been there and done it what, what, what about justin langer for example i mean carlos what, what do you think about that i mean he came in at, to a team in turmoil after the sandpaper incident didn't he and um, and and turned australia around and then it all kind of went a bit pear-shaped at the end but but would justin langer be a good fit do you think um, I mean, Jason Gillespie seemingly had good um, results with Sussex. So I don't think it, I think that shows that Australian coach can come in and have a positive um, impact on the English culture. Um, maybe they need that intensity that Justin Langer brings. We know that's eventually why he got, I guess, shepherded out of the Australian lineup, um, for lack of a better term. Um, but maybe that's what England needs. And, you know, if you look at where Australia are as a team, he just brought them to T T20 World Cup, Ashes victory, but they still felt there was no like direction they wanted to go in. Um, and just hearing, to, hearing Vaughan speak, and that's the, the general thing around the captain and the coach and want to go long term, I could hear similar parallels with my club, my United. Like right now, we need someone who's going to be the best person at the moment for a number of years. You don't got to be forever. So don't look for the next Alex Ferguson. Don't look for the next Joe Root or Michael Vaughan. Who's the best person right now mm. to lead the team, whether as captain, whether as coach, whether as director of cricket. Um, create a framework, create a style of play, a culture. Let our culture seep down from the test team to the county championship. Um and give it time. Once it gets time, and it always, unfortunately, have to go back to the 2015 white ball reset. And the person that I think benefited the most from that is Jason Roy. You see Jason Roy make 20 or six balls after out in the second over 
and the person looking on would just be like, what is he doing? But in that dressing room, he's giving them a head start. That is the style that they want to play. Jason Roy ended up being a, a very critical cog in the wheel of eventually winning a World Cup on home soil. Now, obviously, in test cricket, it's a lot different. You can't just be brash. Um, and actually, you probably need more Joshua De Silva type innings than Jason Roy type innings. But who's the person to drive that? That person needs to be installed and that person needs to be a figurehead, set a style of play and hold people accountable. If you don't do it, your feet are held to the fire and are you willing to get rid of you if you're not going to play and buy into the way the team want to play? It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, you know, we talk about resets and we're constantly having resets, but to have a, a true Red Bull reset, do we need to reset more? Yeah. Well, it, it, you can bring whoever you want in. You know, until the system provides England with more consistent, better cricketers, you know, whoever comes in, he's not going to be Harry Potter. You know, it's a very <laughs> difficult job to take on when you've just not got the quality there to work with at the minute. I think a lot of the younger players with the batting hand have got talent. I think they have a, a, a great opportunity of having success at the highest level, but they just need a little bit more. They need a little bit more in the mentality. Um, I, I think... You know, in, in county cricket, I've watched a bit over the last few years, and, and, and all the ground staff around the country will probably direct message me and abuse me, but the wickets aren't good enough. They aren't good enough for young batters to try and prepare themselves to bat for six to seven hours to get long, big hundreds. And the games that we see in county cricket are lasting two and a half days, two, two days and three quarters, and then you're suddenly asking a young player to go into the test game and play for five days. You know, their brains are trained to bat for an hour or two, get a quick 30, 50 on a pitch that's doing a bit. Um, you know, I, I think we have to start with the pitches. I, I would change the ball in the UK and try and get a ball that doesn't do quite as much. You know, that would drive, you know, more skill. You know, Jimmy Anderson style skillful bowlers. There's a few of them, but I think I'd like to see a few more. And pace and also spin. You know, to be a world-class spin. Now, England were number one in the world in 10-11, world-class spinner Graham Swan. Now, England have got no chance of getting to number one in the world unless they get a world-class spinner. And in our system at the minute, I just don't see enough overs from the spinners. Mm. You know, because of the pitches. Why would you bowl a spinner on a green top? You'd rather bowl a 72-mile-an-hour wobbler with the keeper stood up because he's more effective. So until we get that right, you can put whoever you want in. Get Sir Alex in. He's not going to do anything with this England team because the quality's not there. Until we start mm. driving the quality through the system then we might be able to start thinking, wait a minute, England are on the pathway to becoming number one again. I'm trying mm. to think how many overs Jack Leach bowled in this series, but it was a lot of overs. We did, yeah, we didn't, even, we didn't even see Parkinson. I was disappointed. Mm. I, I wouldn't have minded seeing him. No, I, I, let's, well, let's, let's look at some of the, the pros and cons, you know, the, the positives and the negatives from, from the team as a whole, because, you know, we've focused a lot on, on the leadership, but actually individual bat batters making bad decisions you can't legislate for that you can be the best you could be sir alex ferguson or the cricketing equivalent of but you know if you if you're seeing some hideous shots or just just badly timed leaves or horrendous runouts um then you know what what can you do about that but but on the positive side and we mentioned saki mahmood um yeah. what did what did you make jimmy of the, the, the who who gets the big Jimmy Anderson tick from this squad? Well, I think Saki's the obvious one. He was the one, you know, f for me. I'm, I'm a bit biased as well. I've played with him for quite a bit at lengths. Um, he is someone who, as Carlos said, he's got the the fight. I think as well. He's he's got the skill to to um, to bowl at that level, but he's also got a, a big heart as well. He'll he'll run in when it's tough, um, and we saw that on on pretty. Flat wickets. The, the well, the the first one in particular on his debut, I thought, was a pretty good wicket, um, and the way he ran in and kept running in on that, I thought, w was really good. And he's got skills to be able to get wickets in those conditions as well. He can reverse swing the ball. Uh, he's got a, an action that suits that. He bowls at decent pace, um, and who knew he could bat like that as well? <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> smacking it everywhere. I won't hear the end of that when he gets home. <laughs> oh, yeah. what, what, what about the batters, Michael? Uh, we've, it's nice to see Johnny Bairstow back in the runs, isn't it? But, I mean, you well, know, I'm thinking about in, the positives now. Yeah, Johnny's a class act. Uh, mm. Johnny, when the, you know, the kind of heat he's on, he's one of the players that I actually think he, he's better suited to the pressure. You know, he likes that. You know, you look at the first test match, 48 for four, and Johnny strolls out there. He likes that. We saw that in Australia. He's a, 
a really good number six for England. Um, you know, the captain himself in fine form apart from Grenada. Great to see Ben Stokes playing the way that he did in Barbados. Alex Lees, can't really yeah. judge too much yet. He's had three test matches. He's got in on a few occasions. He's not been able to kick on, I think. From looking at him over three games, he's going to have to have a gear, you know, a gear that you can get in and dig in and then just start to put a bit more pressure on the boulders. I'm sure that'll come with confidence. That crawl is a real disappointment for me mm. because it, it, he's got everything. You know, I hear it all the time from inside the England camp that this kid is, is the one, he's so good. And he plays shots, and you think, well, yeah, he's got a, a really good game on him. You know, saw him in Sydney facing the, the, the heat of that Australian attack and playing it so well. Uh, he gets his 100 in, in the, the first test, second innings, and you think, go on, go and have a big series. Go and get two or three hundreds and really make a name for yourself. And then he made the same mistakes. He just keeps playing that big drive. And until he plays that big drive differently and allows the ball to get to him, and get that head a little bit more over that front pad to control it a little bit more. You know, I, I can imagine the likes of Jimmy Anderson who are just licking his lips, just say, OK, I'll just keep dangling the carrot to you. I'll have a few slips behind, I'll have a drive, man at extra cover, and you can play a couple of them. You can hit one over the top, great, but, you know, if I keep hanging it in there, you're going to make a mistake. And that's something that he has to learn, not just the technical side, but the mental side. If he's going to open the bat in for the, a, a long period of time, you can't play the same way every day. You can't just go out and say, that is the way I pat and that's the way I go and play because conditions change, the situation of the match change, the bowlers that you're facing change. So you as a batter has to be able to change your game as well for the conditions and the situation. And so far what I see, Zach, is if the conditions are in his favour, he's very, very dangerous. But when they're not and there's just a little bit of movement there, mm. it looks like he's going to snick off at uh, pretty much every time he plays that big booming drive. I, I could see him becoming a potential England captain. I'm not quite yep. sure why. I could see him sort of like just, if he could just get, you know, as you say, establish himself in the side because we've had this trouble for the two openers. It said, I saw Alex Lees. He looks like he's got a game, doesn't he? He looks like he's got a technique and he and he looks like he can hang around, albeit on some flat pitches. He's only just starting his career, but you're right. Zach Crawley, for me, I don't, how, do you, how do you do that though, Mike? How do you get that out of someone? Why is it not happening? You know? <laughs> It's just, it, it, he can only do that. Yeah. You know, he's played 21 test matches now. He's got a couple of centuries. He's played some lovely innings. He's got that double yeah. century against Pakistan. So he can Likes score runs at the highest level. It's yeah. just that if he wants to be a consistent performer, and it's hard at the top of the order because the ball's fresh and the bowlers are fresh, but you know, there's not many in the history of the game have, have got away with being really aggressive from ball one. There's no. not many. You could argue for him to say, well, and maybe Michael Slater, you know, but... There's not many. That's Most you. opening players have a little bit of a Craig Brathwaite approach. They dig in and they hang in and they bat for the first session. And when they're still there after lunch and the sun's still shining, then they can go up in the gears. But I just think he's got to learn. He's got to just change the way that he plays. And also his mindset's got to be different. Mm. Carlos? Or drop down a couple of paces. <laughs> oh, Carlos, <laughs> captain. Best, best over captain. Ooh. Yeah, go on. Why not? You reckon, Jim? He's just taking a drink of his Sorry, tea. He's just it all out. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, yeah, I mean, look, this. I, I, again, I'm I'm going to sit on the fence because I'm in a tricky position. Um, but the, you know, Johnny's a, a great bloke to have in your team. It, we've seen how good he is as a batter. He's competitive, um, and I, I I just you know with someone like him potentially he might lose something when if he if he did that so. Um, I wouldn't want to take away something that is a super strength of Johnny's, which is being able to take the, the attack to the opposition coming in at six. Mm. Well, that's does, are... does why, does why me personally, looking at the situation, I can't, I can't look at it and think, give Ben Stokes captaincy long term. Like, the amount of energy he puts into the game, yeah. batting, bowling, fielding, he's a leader. They've got certain people in your team that don't need the title of captain to be a leader and to help drive the culture. You're more looking at Bear Store, Stokes, as kind of deputies that if Rook misses a test as he did in the COVID series versus West Indies, you know Stokes is a good enough captain to step in and fill the breach for a test, for a session, or whatever. But the mental toll preparing before a test match, doing interviews, being pulled away from a warm-up. Like, they've got so much that goes into captaincy that it needs to be someone that not only can make the team and good enough to make the team, but someone could handle the extrinsic pressures and stresses 
of being a captain because it can mount up and it can look frivolous. But when you've got your own game to contend with, looking at everything else outside, dealing with the team, um, and then doing interview left, right, and center, and they know the English media is relentless, you need to find somebody that can cope with it as much off the field as on the field. Hmm. Well, we've had some interesting suggestions as future England captains in this last hour. Um, we're going to see how that all unfolds and the future of the Test team as well. Um, Michael, we're going to talk about the West Indies. We'll talk about the Women's World Cup after the news as well. Um, but but, but you, you've got a nip off, I think. But but Michael, before we let you go, I, I know you've been back to Australia this this last week, haven't you? Because it's Shane Warne's memorial service on on Wednesday. Um, still seems extraordinary to say that you, you went to his funeral this week didn't you? I just, I just wondered how, how that was, what kind of an occasion it was. You know, your thoughts about, about the great man. Uh, it, it was emotional, as you, as you would expect. His uh, three kids were, were incredible. Um, they, they all gave very heartfelt, um, emotive speeches, uh, as did a few of his real close friends. Um, Wednesday will be more of a celebration. You know, the, the, the family funeral was very, well, as you can imagine, um, very kind of emotional for everyone there but I think on, on Wednesday I think the family wanted to be a real celebration of his life it's at the G uh, they're unveiling his stand he'll be very proud of that uh, obviously his statues uh, outside the G as well uh, there's loads of cans with fags and all sorts of pies that have been uh, put beside the statue typical one like a Vegemite so they'll have a, I, I hope a great celebration of uh, you know the King's unbelievable 52 years one, one thing for sure about with Shane he's you know, he's lived 52 years. You know, he's, he's given it a right good go. Um, desperately sorry to see him, you know, leave us so, so, so young. Uh, we all knew him so well. He was just uh, the heartbeat of any, any room, golf club, dressing room, cricket pitch, morning of a match when he's broadcasting. You know, he was just the heartbeat of mm. wherever he was and uh, he's going to be greatly missed. Yeah, one, one little thing. One little thing as well, uh, Ellie. Um, it, it, they always say that no one's ever bigger than the game, but if anyone got close to it, I think yeah. Shane Warne did. You know, he won't fall yeah. off. <laughs> Absolutely. The Five Live Cricket Show. And welcome back to Five Live Cricket with me, Eleanor Oldroyd, Phil Tufnell and Jimmy Anderson are still with us, as is Carlos Brathwaite. And Carlos, it's about time we gave West Indies some credit for winning that Test match. Uh, winning the series uh, means they've only lost one series at home to England since 1968. And there were some pretty standout performances throughout, weren't they? What, what made you most proud of... Of the series as a whole, but particularly what happened in that final test? Um, foundations that um, are being shown um, is reminiscent of a few years ago. I think it was 2018, 2019, when they had a run of series against Sri Lanka and Bangladesh at home. Um, and I think that was kind of the beginning of the run of Jason Holder. Um, in his ascendancy to number one all around in the world. Kimar Roach ever since then hasn't stopped taking wickets. I felt as though they had a set team, uh, much like England. They're still fiddling with the batting order a bit. Um, but at least now we know, okay, Craig and another opener. I think Shamar Brooks, as good of friends we are, um, his play will be up for debate at number three. Bonner's kind of cemented his play. Um, Blackwood is the vice captain at five. So they've shown that there's a little bit of stability there and you now know the positions that are up for grabs, bowling-wise, to have the framework that they did. Putting Jace to number six was a bold move, I think, and they were vindicated. Um, as I Joseph showed how well he can do with the bat, and I think that took some of the pressure off them thinking that they'll lose something in the, in the low order. Um, and then the flexibility to be able to go in without a spinner and add Kyle Mears. Um, that is, I think, the hallmark of that foundation being laid. Um, the next test would be to see how they'd incorporate two spinners when they go to the subcontinent. Um, but I think the hallmark of every good test team is a solid foundation. You know, when you, when you play Australia, they're going to have Stark, Hazelwood, Cummings, Lyon. 
And if one of them drop out, it's almost going to be a like-for-like -like replacement. There's not many surprises that happens with a great test team. Um, and although they are very far away from being great, I think they're building solid foundations now. And this is probably one of the more complete test teams that we've probably had for the last decade and probably even more. I can't look back past um, Courtney Walsh, Kurtley Ambrose, Brian Lara, Chanda Paul, Hooper, and think of a more settled unit um, with good foundations as this team has and has been building towards. So I think we always bring our best when England come to town. But for me, regardless of the result, to be able to see the team create this foundation and this framework in which they want to play, how they want to go about this stuff was most pleasing. We only need to mention Kirtley Ambrose, toughers, don't we, for you to shudder and start coming oh, out yeah. in hives. Yeah, there was, was a few names there. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Lara was another one of those that gave me a little <laughs> shudder as well. I think I think what impressed me as well about it was just just the the discipline and the game plan. You know, listen, there were a couple of tough old test matches there, weren't they, on flat pitches and everything, which sometimes people think that oh you just go out there and it's a flat pitch come on we go and do it but uh, I just saw you know as Carlos was saying there like a discipline and a determination and a kind of a you know let, let's stick to what we know here and a unity as well that people were staying in the play for each other I think as you say Jason Holder in a funny sort of way I know he's not captain now but and Craig Brathwaite's come in and, and he's obviously doing a good job but I just think that that has brought like that's freed him up a little bit as well to sort of drive it as well and just take a little bit of a back seat. But uh, yeah, mm. hats off, stuck in it, stuck in it all the way, um, and uh, uh, you know, and, and nicked it at the end and thoroughly deserved it because those kind of those kind of series as are tough back to back test matches, playing all the time, and, and England's wheels just came on where where the West Indies you know stayed strong. Jimmy, you, you played against them obviously in, back at home in 2020 in that kind of bizarre COVID series that we yeah. had in, in the in the bio bubbles. How how have they developed since then? Do you think? Um, well, I, do you know what? I, I I think you could go further back than that. Um, so I, you know, as we talked about, an England side's not won there since 2004. So that I've been on all those tours since then. Um, and it's been and it, the, what the West Indies do is they make it really hard for you. And I, I'm not sure there's a a better team on a flat pitch, uh, you know, mm. certainly in their own conditions. They just know exactly how to play. They've got a, a great template to, for, for playing. Um, you know, they know what the guys at the top of the order are going to do. They're going to just try and um, work their way through the new ball if they can, get it to a place where they can get. You've got, you, then you've got more attacking batsmen coming in down the order, uh, and then with the ball exactly the same, they've got. Bowlers, certainly Jason Holder, someone who's who's been fantastic. Kimo Roach, amazing bowler yeah. uh, in all conditions. Um, but those guys in particular have, have held that bowling attack together uh, and allowed other guys to come in and, and, and play around them as well. Um, but I just feel like they, they're, they're... I do feel like it's England as well, though. Just, I've had so many occasions where I just think they, they, they just bring out the... It brings out the best in them. Uh, I remember a game at Headingley when... Uh, we set them 350 and they chase them down. Shea Hope yeah. getting a, a hundred, amazing 100 there. Um, so there are, you know, it, it, they're, for me, it, they've been a really difficult side to be, in particular in the West Indies. I think it's because they've got that solid structure throughout. Mm. And it feels as well, Carlos, from listening to, I was listening to the TMS podcast um, today and, you know, just, just discussions around the fact that there's there's this kind of cohesiveness in the team and, and they all seem to be coming together they seem to be getting on really well there's, there's good atmosphere in the team room and and this is for a, a team which it's it's not an easy job in the Caribbean because of the different countries that are involved because people are coming from all the different islands yeah it is is one that is probably not matched anywhere else in professional sport or international sport I should say where is more like a franchise team coming on the one banner. Um, if you think about it, as much as I love the West Indies anthem, it literally was a folk song and a soca song 15 years ago or whatever. So that in itself, when it is bad, it's really bad. But when it's good, there's so much different sovereign nations, so much different cultures that when you do find the best blend of it all, um, 
you can get performances such as the one that we get. And, you know, one of the things that I guess I wasn't privy to see, but I just talking about hypotheticals, when Blackwood played that shot, I could imagine Craig Brathwaite having a very stern word with him. Um, not in the sense where he calls him out in a crowd, that's not Craig's style, but one-on-one, like just letting him have it. Um, and then you can see the way he batted with Craig in the second test. And I think what what has been the, a blessing for those guys is that not a lot of those guys would play franchise cricket around the world. So their bread and butter is test cricket. Outside of probably Jason Holder, now Alzari Joseph within the last year, year and a half or so, and Kyle Mears, not much of the other guys will be sought after. So they play first class cricket together. A lot of them would have come through the surgical high performance center together. Um, they'll always be on the test tours when there's these best V best games that they kind of had to develop um, in and around school with to try to get games when they were no first class cricket. Um, which I don't think we've had, we don't have had a proper season for two years. So they've always had to find pivots and find ways to get cricket. But these guys have been together because this is their bread and butter. So I think they have a camaraderie off the field that goes beyond just coming together um, for every series. They stay in contact with each other when they play for us class cricket and go to other islands. They go out with each other. Um, so I think that bond is one that um, well, luckily stems from years and years of the high performance centre all the way through first class cricket. And it's probably one that, you know, as easy as it may seem to build, is quite difficult in an insular um, climate with so many different sovereign nations. But as I say, when it does get blended up nicely, it produces stuff like um, 20, I think it's 2012, 2004, um, with Bradshaw and Brown. Mm-hmm. Champions Trophy 2016 when we won, um, when the girls won, when the under 19s won, when we win series like this, when we win series against Sri Lanka and Bangladesh at home, when we get it right, um, I don't think there's not a better team to watch in any format of cricket. Just enjoy the success. Um, but the challenge has always been to keep that consistent and replicate it over a period of time. Well, some in the celebrations at, in Grenada afterwards at the at, at the end of the game were, were fantastic, and I think they probably went on long into the evening. Um, but you, you mentioned Carlos at the start of the program, actually the celebrations for the West Indies women as well. Uh, watching that nail biter in in the Women's World Cup between um, South Africa and India, South Africa won it, so West Indies go through to the semi final. And if you if you can find it on on Twitter, just the yeah. celeb- the, uh, just that j- moment of joy as the team all came together and <laughs> celebrated reaching a World Cup semi final. Of course, England also through to the semi-finals of the World Cup. They beat Bangladesh on Saturday night, so that means that they will take on South Africa in the last four. Uh, Australia play West Indies tomorrow night in the other semi-final. Both games live on Five Live Sports Extra and on BBC Sounds. And England's victory over Bangladesh capped a terrific turnaround after losing their first three matches of the group stage. And I've been speaking to England bowler Anya Shrubsole. Um, I guess we always hoped that we would be in this situation, but... Um we knew that we'd made life pretty hard for ourselves and, and maybe needed a couple of results to go our way, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, never what you want. So um, we always had that belief within the group, but to actually turn it around and win four games on the bounce, I guess, is testament to the character within the squad. Uh, I mean, as you say, you haven't done this intentionally, but it has got, got you in a knockout mentality, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. The last four games have effectively been knockout games. So I think that's something that can really work in our favour in the semi-final. Because um, like you said, we've be effectively been playing knockout cricket since since the fourth game. So what has turned the mood around, do you think? What, what What's brought the winning back? Oh, it's, it's quite hard to put a finger on exactly what it is. We obviously um, had some honest conversations after the first couple of games about um, where we needed to improve and, and those things we really felt were in our control um, in terms of we'd obviously fielded really badly and I think that cost us a couple of a couple of wins there were we'd bowled quite a lot of extras in the first few games and, and little things like that that were definitely within our control so it was about finding a way to turn those around and, and I guess most importantly finding a way to maintain um, belief that if we got those things right that the results would turn around 
Mm. And, and do you think there was something that it set in really during the ashes, just that, that feeling maybe of just forgetting what that, that winning feeling was like? <laughs> It was potentially a bit of that, yeah. It's obviously winning is a habit and and losing can become a bit of a habit as well. So um, it definitely (laughs) felt like a long time since, I guess, since our last win. And it was just about getting that first one on the board and then then using the momentum that came with that. So I think that game against India really started to turn things around and we've just kind of grown since then, really. I've got to take you back to Bristol and the 2017 semi-final against South Africa um, and, and you were there <laughs> hitting those winning runs to <laughs> the death. Um, what are your memories of that extraordinary tense finish? Um, yeah, it was, it was quite, a, it's quite a tough watch, um, to be honest. It was, it was one of those games that you kind of felt quite early in the, in the chase for us that it was going to get quite tight. Um, didn't really know how tight, but it was always going to get quite tight and um yeah, it was it was one of those games where you just kind of had to find a way to get over the line, and I think I stole a lot of glory by hitting the winning runs. But there was, I think it was Jenny Gunn and Fran put on a, had an unbelievable partnership um, that really set us up in that game. So, but hopefully that this semi final isn't as close as that, and I'm definitely hopefully not required to walk out to the middle. But it was obviously pressure there to get into a home World Cup final at Lords was, was immense, and we we're just fortunate to get over the line. And, and you won the CMJ Spirit of Cricket Award, I think, didn't you, that year? Because you consoled the South African girls who were on the pitch, obviously devastated at the end. I mean, what, what do you remember about that, about that kind of moment of, I don't know, instinct, I suppose, to console a beaten teammate? I, I just, I've been there before, basically. Um, I've played long enough that, unfortunately, we've lost semi-finals and finals. And, and you just know how that feels. It's... I guess it's everything you've kind of built towards and gone kind of ebbed and flowed and there'd have been times where they thought they were almost there and, it, and it's absolutely it's absolutely devastating so um, yeah it wasn't something I necessarily thought a huge amount but I just I just knew how it felt and it's and it's not a nice feeling mm-hmm. Just a final thought Heather Knight has said that there are still improvements that can be made in the team do you agree with her? Yeah absolutely we haven't put together our complete performance yet um, which is exciting you you kind of want to be building through a tournament and that's definitely what we've what we've done um, so hopefully now's the time that you really want to put your best foot forward and bring everything together and I think if we do that we'll be within a good chance of winning Well that was Anya Shrubsall um, with me a little bit earlier on uh, Alex Hartley World Cup winner is joining us as well from New Zealand Hi Alex morning Hello good morning Morning. Morning, Jimmy. Jimmy's been watching a lot of the the World <laughs> Women's World Cup as well. I think uh, Carlos as well, and and Phil are still with us. Um, Alex, just word about Anya. She she's got a way of putting herself at the heart of the drama, hasn't she? Um, winning runs in <laughs> the semi final, winning wicket. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> but whether it's, whether it's intentional or not, she's she's there, isn't she? I mean, she's a match winner. She is, she is a match winner and I guess she shows why she's a senior player and why she's played cricket for so long in those crucial situations. Even, you know, the the game against New Zealand, she went out, they didn't need many to win, there was seven overs left but it was really tense, you know, one stage thought England were going to lose, they found themselves losing games they shouldn't in the last couple of months so you know, she, she finds a way and she's so calm, she strides out to the crease batting at number 11 and whether or not she's faking it, but she looks like she, you know, she's in total control. As a tail ender, Jimmy, you must be proud of what Anya does. Yeah, well, she makes makes it look a lot easier than I do when I come out to bat. Um, but yeah, it's. I think, you know, you need those sorts of players in those situations that have been there, they've done it, they've they've played in those pressurised situations, and I think that's what's helped this last few weeks as well. Because you, as Anya touched on there in her interview. The, the three losses at the start of the, the tournament weren't any other doing other than England's, I don't think. There were, there were mistakes throughout the team, whether it was in the field, um, with the bat or the extras she mentioned as well there. And when you've got that experience there, you've got Anya, you've got uh, Catherine Brunt, you've got Nat Siver, you've got Heather Knight as captain, you've got that experience throughout the, the, the spine of the team, then they know, because they've been there before, they know that how you're going to get out of that situation and it takes it take it does take senior players I think sometimes to do that 
Um, obviously, ably helped by Sophie Eccleston, leading wicket taker in the in the tournament, uh, and and everyone sort of chipped in from there. And I think, you know, it wasn't the the, the first couple of wins weren't smooth, but since then every performance has got better and better and more polished and more polished. And I think, you know, that that can only be a a good thing. And you know, for for the basically for the mood of the camp, really, you're going into a semi final knowing that you're just you're not quite there yet, not not played the best. Um, I don't think yet, but they're definitely on the right track. Mm. I, th- I think they forgot a little bit how to win at the start of the. You know what I mean? They mm. were dropping catches. The fielding was poor. But in, in a funny sort of way, I, I'd make, I'm making them almost sort of favourites to win this semi final now. You know what I mean? To go out there and you've almost thrown the shackles off a little bit. You know what I mean? And and, and it's like a disease f- fielding. It's a lack of confidence. But they're sort of like they were playing under pressure earlier. Now go out there, enjoy it, show what you can do. And as Jimmy was saying there, the senior players stand up. They're a fantastic team. Just go out there, enjoy it. I think they played a little bit scared early on. Then you lose the odd one and the confidence goes. But that seems to be coming back. And it's all it's all about peaking at the right time. And, and also done po- that for sure. They're also playing against South Africa who've ha- had a really nervous wrecking uh, last mm. game and that you know sometimes that adrenaline rush from winning such a tight game when you think oh we, we, we might have lost it here and then yet you know things get turned around so you end up winning the game that can then take a lot out of you as a team uh, and then you've got to get yourself back up again a few days later for a, for a mm. huge semi-final mm. and, and Alex remembering remembering that 2017 semi-final I mean as, as Anya said you, you know you're playing in a game and so much was resting on England getting to the final at Lords. You know that the you know Claire Connor had said we're going to sell out Lords. England had to get to the final, didn't they? And and in a way, the pressure isn't on them in quite the same way this time. Yeah, I guess in 2017, a home World Cup final has you know a once in a lifetime feeling to it. So that comes with more added pressure for for players, for you know staff, everybody. And it was it was a tense game. You know we we tried not to look too far forward to get into the final and take it game gap by game. I guess they don't have that pressure this time of it being a home World Cup, but they do have the pressure of being defending champions and the fact that they started terribly and now everybody's looking at them being like, well, how they how they lost their first three games and now they're in the semi-finals. This, this group stage has been crazy. You know, they've all been nail biters of games, each and every one of them. So I guess it's England have found a way. It's been gritty. They've found a way and, and now being defending champions they've, they've got a point to prove that they are the best in the world or can be the best in the world even though they've not played their best cricket yet well we, we do know the best in the world pretty much without question are Australia who have been so dominant I mean, Carlos how do you how do you fancy the West Indies chances against Australia in the semi <laughs> pressure's off thankfully um, I think they started the way that they started the tournament was complete opposite to England um, getting over the line um, finding ways to win, and then they just had like a, a bit of a, a bump in the road, um, a washout game, and then the game lost on um, the poor Lewis Stern. Um, so they really haven't had much momentum, if we can be honest. Um, and this is one of them times before the tournament. Speaking to Wisden, I said, "Look, Wisden is the team that if they can make it to the final four, they can produce two good performances to win the trophy." So. Western is a team that don't need momentum. We don't need players playing at the best. Um, Stephanie Taylor could come and strike 100, Haley Matthews, DeAndre Dotton, and take the game away. Um, but the batting definitely needs to be looked at because with the quality that Australia has, if West Indies find themselves 40 for three or 40 for four, and those three names that I mentioned are gone, we can't put up a rear guard action strong enough to hold off Australia. So it needs to be a complete team effort from the opener straight down, get 250 or so. And that's something that we could work with if that heavy Australia batting lineup gets a good start. Mm. Uh, Alex, we, we were talking about the fact that South Africa are coming off the back of a, a real nail biter to get mm. to this point to, against India. But but I mean, they've got some big name players, haven't they? They've got some incredibly talented players who, who England are going to have to presumably will will know exactly what they need to do against against these bit these big name these big name um, players that South Africa have. Yeah, yeah, they've got they've got some amazing players. You know, Laura Wolfart. I think she's the leading run scorer in the competition so far. She's just churning them out. Hasn't got um, a World Cup 100 yet. Keeps getting out in the 80s and 90s. So she's going to be incredibly frustrated with herself. But a very talented player. 
their captain Sunil loses as like just found a way of accumulating runs. And then they've got Marazan Cap and Ishmael with the seam and with their seam who've two world class players, you know, and, and Cap's been a match winner for South Africa throughout this tournament. She got them over the line against against England hitting a six. So it's it's been one of those tournaments where each individual they've in South Africa, they've all stepped up and they've they've won nail biting games. But you sort of wish as an England fan those games are out the way for them now. Mm. Right then, guys, give us some predictions. How who are we going to be talking about in the final next Sunday? What do you reckon, England. Jimmy? Oh. I'm go- I'm going England Australia. I, th- I think um, you know Australia. I think I just they've got too much for for most teams as we've seen over the last well. 12, 18 months, maybe even longer than that, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful England are on the right sort of path, uh, keep keep that sort of progression of performance going, get better and better as it goes on. I'd love to see a, an England victory in that final against Australia, especially after the ashes that we saw uh, in the winter just gone. How sweet would that be? Tough as what do you think? Yeah, I'm going with Jimmy. England, Australia and England to judge it and peak just at the right time all the pressures on australia to try and come through they're meant to be the best team out there and uh they uh, they fade away and we retain the world cup there you go carlos come are you going to say west indies south africa uh, carlos? okay i can't be i can't be i can't be the two other boys um but as jimmy mentioned earlier i do think that emotionally south africa may be drained so we will have to give england the upper hand for that one unfortunately um, but West Indies to have a individual moment of brilliance, beat Australia, and then West Indies to beat England again. <laughs> hey, there you go. Are you going to be nervous, Alex? What do you think? Yeah, I'm already nervous to be honest with you. Um, it's going to be. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be Australia, England. You know, it's, it's sort of written in the stars for England not to win a game against Australia all winter and then do it when it matters. <laughs> 